So this is all about investment decision rules. We've got all these projects out there. We have to have some rules to decide which ones we're going to invest in and which ones we uh, should run away from. This is why finance is more interesting than accounting. By the way, do I have any accountants here? I, I didn't think I did. So I will tell you what I tell students at the majors fair. They come up to me, bright eyed, 18, 19 years old, and I say, do you know what you want to do with your life? And they say, well, it's either accounting or finance. And I say, do you know the difference between the two? And here's what I usually get, uh, right? Because they don't. I say, okay, let me tell you the difference between finance and accounting. Accounting is all about recording what happened in the past using a set of random rules arrived at by a bunch of boring old men. That's accounting. Finance is about making decisions about what to do in the future using fundamental laws of mathematics that have been in place since the beginning of the universe. Now, which one of those is sexier? Oh, finance for sure, right? Yeah. You know, in, in uh, New York City, they have what they call Finance and Fashion Week, where they get uh, people from finance and people from fashion together to try to mingle. Do you ever think they have accounting and finance week or accounting and uh, fashion week? No. Okay, uh, finance is definitely sexier. Okay, so the, we're making these decisions. We need to have some rules about how we're going to make those decisions, and and more importantly, which ones we should run away from. And we're going to look at multiple rules here. I'm going to end up telling you that one of them is better than the rest, but some of them still have a place. Some of these still have a place in certain situations. Some of them stink so badly that we should never use them regardless. Any questions before we get started here? Okay. So how are we gonna know a good rule from a bad rule? Well, a good investment rule is going to account for the time value of money because we know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now. And it's also going to account for the riskiness of the cash flows because we know that safer future cash flows are worth more than risky future cash flows. And then finally, it should provide information regarding the wealth created by the project. What's the goal of financial management? Say again? Maximize your older wealth. It's probably what you said, but you speak so softly. I couldn't catch it. Okay, um, so maximize shareholder wealth. If we don't have some information on whether or not we're creating wealth, can we know whether or not we're living out the goal of financial management? It's difficult, if not impossible, at that point. So those are the three things we're going to do. And each one of these rules that I talk about, I'm going to rank them on a scale of one to three stars. I'm going to rank them on a scale of one to three stars. If they answer yes to each of these questions, they will get three stars. Anything less than that, they're going to get less than that. And when I mention that the top one is rated three stars, sometimes students get confused because on Amazon, how many stars are there? Five. On Blackboard, how many stars are there? Five. Did you know that the choice of the number of stars was arbitrary? The choice of my number of stars is not arbitrary, right? I got three questions, three stars. Questions? Okay. So the first one we're going to talk about is net present value. And net present value often gets defined as the present value of all the future cash flows minus the initial investment. I hate that definition. I hate that definition because it sounds like all the investment has to happen at time zero. Let's discuss a recent project. You guys know about the Gigafactory Berlin that Tesla's building. It's an electric car plant. You could guess that, Tesla, right? Electric car plant in Germany, and they've been working on this thing for two, three years. And they have yet to crank out a production car from it. They're making the pre-production models, but they've yet to start cranking out the production cars. Did all the investment happen at time zero? No. They had investment at time zero, at time one, at time two. They probably will not start seeing cash flows in the other way until time three or time four. Who knows? And so I changed this definition a little bit. 
to cover that. What I say is it's the sum of the present values of all the project cash flows, where cash flows in are positive and cash flows out are negative. My definition allows for investment in more than just the very beginning period. Okay, so NPV represents the wealth created by the project. And the rule is that we accept all projects with an NPV greater than zero, but we reject all with an NPV equal to or greater than zero. And why are we going to do that? Because accepting the positive NPV projects is how we build shareholder wealth because that NPV, the money that we create, actually belongs to the shareholders. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about this from a perspective of theory versus reality. In theory, on my homeworks, on my practices, and on my exams, if the NPV is positive, you should accept it. Do you think that's always the, true, the case in the real world? No. So what if I tell you that the NPV is positive 100? Theoretically, we should accept it. If I tell you that we have to invest $500 to get that NPV, it still sounds very reasonable. But what if I tell you we have to invest $1 billion to get that positive 100? Now we should start looking a little more carefully. Probably not the best idea. I don't mind risking $500. I definitely mind risking a billion dollars. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me tell you my own personal experience here. I had, this is a 1997-ish, I, I had the oldest machines in the factory. The machines were all built in 1979 or before. So some of them were like even older than I was. And so it was time for me to get some new machines in there because maintenance costs, production stuff, anyway. So we go out and find this machine we're gonna buy for $700,000. And we do the NPV analysis and it's 25,000 positive. Should we accept or reject the project? We should definitely accept it, right? Theoretically. Now, this machine required 12 inches of concrete to, in order to anchor the machine to the floor. So you gotta drill holes and drop these anchors in. And the reason you gotta do that is with precision machinery, making precision items like we were, you have to have this machine be totally still. Otherwise, it's like your, your mom's uh, washing machine, you know how it kind of walks across the floor when you get your tennis shoes and you guys have never done that? Go home, try that out. Okay, so otherwise it walks around and makes really bad parts, so you don't want to do that. And so we roll out the plants, plans for the plant. The plant was built in 1962 on a big Texas cotton field. And we roll out the plans and the plans say that there are 14 inches of concrete in the spot where we want to put this machine. 14 is greater than 12, we should be good to go. We get the machine in, the day comes, the guy comes to install the machine and gets out his drill. And here's what it looked like. He's, he's gonna drill the anchor holes. And everybody's face looks like this. Four inches of concrete, not 14. Do we have a problem now? Yeah, because Texas cotton field doesn't support in the same way as concrete. And so what do we have to do? We have to get in there and we have to cut a rectangle out with a concrete saw, which is a real thing, by the way. Then we have to get in there with a jackhammer and bust all that concrete out, get it out. And then we have to get in one of those tiny little backhoe things in there and dig the hole out. And then we have to put in reinforcing rod and wire because concrete is only strong in compression, not in tension. You guys don't need to know that. Um, and then finally we get everything smoothed away and we let this stuff cure for like 24 hours and then we're back to where we started. But here's what you need to know. That little detour cost us $40,000. Do you remember what my NPV was prior to the start? Positive 25 and now we've turned it into negative 15, right? And so was 25,000 enough of a positive NPV to accept this project? Absolutely not. Now, how did I fix this problem going forward? On every project going forward, I always added in 10%
contingency. Do you guys know what contingency means? Just in case, right? I would add in 10% contingency. And after that, I never had a project run over budget, but they always ran higher than if I had not included the contingency. In other words, we are always eating into that contingency. So when you guys are doing projects in the real world, uh, that that positive NPV, you got to be skeptical about it. You got to use some some common sense because you could wind up making a bad mistake. Now students often ask me, uh, what did we do about the contractor who obviously shorted us on that concrete? So keep in mind the years 1997, the plant was built in 1962. My guess is that the uh, contractor was now in a nursing home somewhere. And apparently what my students want me to do is to go hunt this guy down and kink his oxygen tube <laughs> and, until he confesses. You know, you know, a lot of times in business you just end up eating this stuff and moving on. Questions? Okay. So what do we need for NPV? We need the initial investment amount. Of course, we're assuming all investment here at time zero. We need to know the future cash flows and their timing. By the way, why do you think it's important to know their timing? Yes, we'll be discounting it correctly because a dollar that we get one year from now is worth more than a dollar we get 10 years from now. And we need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. By the way, that's what the last chapter was all about, was figuring out these, uh, the appropriate rate for the riskiness of the cash flows. So here's our pathetically easy example. We have $100. We can either invest that cash today and pay out a dividend of 107 one year from today or pay out 100 today. Our investors can earn 6% on their money. What's the NPV of investing the cash? There we go. It's minus 100 is our initial investment plus the present value of that 107. 107 divided by 1.06 is something um, greater than 100. And so we end up with an NPV of positive 94 cents. Do we accept or reject the project? Theoretically. Theoretically, we accept the project. Now, when we do, what does this mean for shareholder wealth? It means that shareholder wealth increases by 94 cents. If we had 94 shares outstanding, in theory, they should all go up in price by one cent. In theory. Does that make sense? Can you repeat it, please? Can I repeat that? Sure. Okay, the NPV here is 94 cents, that's positive. So we're going to accept it. Now, what does that mean for shareholder wealth? Shareholder wealth, for all the shareholders, goes up by 94 cents, not a piece altogether. What if we had 94 shares outstanding? We would take that 94 cents, divide by the 94 shares, each share then should go up by one cent on their share price. Because do you remember NPV Go where we added uh, the growth opportunities on top of that? On top of the cash cow value? That's what we're doing here. We're looking at how much is this going to add to the current value of the firm. It's going to add 94 cents overall, divide that by 94 shares. It should bump the price of each one of those shares by one cent. And in fact, this is a way you can determine what the market thinks of projects. When uh, you announce a new project and you look at how much did the market value of the equity go up upon that announcement, that gives you a rough idea of what the market thinks the NPV of your project is. And then you can look at that and compare it to your own numbers and say, oh wow, did we get that wrong? Or yeah, we had a pretty good guess there. Does that make sense? By the way, the market. Does there have to be someone out there that knows more about this project? Does there have to be one single person who knows more about this project than us in order for the market to have a better idea of what's going on than we do? No. Think about the market. You've got millions of participants, and they're all, they all have a little bit of information. And they all buy and sell based on that information. And so they will, it's, it's the idea is like the wisdom of the crowd, right? Where it's, uh, if you just ask one person, the answer would undoubtedly be wrong. But when you get the whole group together and you see the net effect of their biddings up and down, 
then you figure out pretty pretty much what's uh, a good what's a good thing and what's a bad thing. By the way, if the share price goes down when you announce a project, what's the, what's the market saying to you? Positive or negative net present value? Yeah, it's negative. At this point, what should you do? Stop the yeah, stop the project, right? At least. If you stop the project, they figure out that you're smart enough to know to stop the project. You may be dumb enough to take on a negative MPV project, but at least you're smart enough to know when you've when you've made a mistake. Questions? Okay, so let's ask our three questions. Number one, does MPV account for the time value of money? Yes, how? Yeah, we discount those future cash flows based on how far out they are. The second question, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? What was the third ingredient we needed for NPV? Yeah, discount rate appropriate to the risk of the cash flows, right? And so that is how we're accounting for that riskiness of the cash flows is through the discount rate. And then finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Absolutely it does. It gives us dollars and cents. Of course, keep in mind it's a swag. It gives us dollars and cents estimate of the wealth created by the project. So how many stars do we give in PV? Three. It is a three star out of three kind of measure. Therefore, we say NPV is the gold standard because we can answer yes to all those criteria. And so going forward, what we're going to do is we will compare all these other rules to NPV to see where they fall short. NPV works every time. Now, I say it works every time. You notice it's in quotes there. There's a little problem, and that is garbage in, garbage out. What does that mean? Yeah, if, even if my spreadsheet, which is how we're going to do this, even if my spreadsheet were perfect, if I throw garbage into it, the number that comes out of it is garbage. Does that make sense? And so when I say it works every time, it works every time given the correct numbers. Questions? Now we're going to go from the most complex to the simplest one. This is called the payback period. That's the amount of time that it takes for a, for a project to break even. So how are we going to figure that out? We're going to start with our initial amount, and then we're going to add, so that would be negative, and we're going to add back the cash flows as the years go by until we hit zero, and that's where you break even. Now, what is our rule here? We're going to accept all projects that pay back on or before an arbitrary cutoff. What does arbitrary mean? Yeah, yeah made up. Um, we, we, in polite society, we would say we pulled it out of air. Pulled it out of the air. In, in impolite society, what would we say? Yeah, you pull it out of your ass, uh, but the scientific name for that is anal extrapolation, just in case you hadn't heard that one before. Okay, so you're gonna come up with this number. Now, it sounds like you know you're just flipping a coin or rolling a dice or whatever and it's not quite like that so let me tell you about where i saw a payback period for the first time i went to work for a company that was in fairly bad shape and uh, we brought in a person from outside and he was actually if you've ever had an m anybody here ever had an mri yeah and i'm pretty sure you have right um yeah, if you have, you can thank a man named Ed Phipps. Ed Phipps worked at GE, and he helped actually commercialize that technology. So by the time he becomes our VP of manufacturing, uh, he's been around, he's seen a lot. And so when he comes up with our arbitrary cutoff, it's not just a number he's picking out of the air. He is looking at our situation, the money that we have, and the opportunities that we have, and using his experience, he comes up with two years. So it's not nearly as crazy as it might sound if you've got an experienced person that's doing the work. Questions? Okay.
So what do we need for payback? Number one, we need the initial investment amount. Does that sound familiar? Sounds just like NDD. Number two, we need the future cash flows and their timing. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, so far it's exactly the same as NPV. But the third thing here we need is the arbitrary cutoff, and that would be in years. What are we missing here that we had to have for NPV that we don't have here? Yeah, the discount rate. And what does that tell us about payback's ability to consider the risk of the cash flows? It doesn't, right? It doesn't, it's not, so we know it's going to be short on at least one of those things. So here's our example. Uh, in, in fact, what will happen is you will get the column T and the column cash flow, and then you'll need to make up the column balance on your own. So what's the payback of the following cash flows? Our arbitrary cutoff is two years. Um, cash flow at time zero is minus 50,000. That is our initial investment. And then after that, we get 30,000, 20,000, and 10,000. So how do I figure the balance for year zero? Well, it's just that initial cash flow out. In fact, I think of this as being like a reverse checkbook. You know, with the checkbook, you put in a positive amount and then you write out little negative amounts. Hopefully they're little, right? And with this, we are writing out a big negative amount and then we're adding small positive amounts. So it's just the opposite of the checkbook. In the beginning, our balance is negative 50,000. And then at, uh, so that's our balance, and then we had 30,000 positive during year one. Negative 50,000 plus 30,000 gives us negative 20,000. So that is our balance at the end of year one. Have we broken even yet? No, we're still negative. Okay, year two. Now we're gonna collect $20,000. 20,000 plus minus 20,000 gives us zero. Have we broken even yet? Yeah, in fact, we break even perfectly on year two. Our rule says to accept on or, or if it's greater than or equal to the arbitrary cutoff. Do we accept or reject this project? And yeah, we accept it, right? Because it is equal to. Now, this all seems really, really, really easy, but sometimes it's not so pretty. Let's assume that we go out and negotiate that initial cost down. And I'm gonna give you a little aside here about projects. Engineers love machines, right? Lousy negotiators, but they love machines. So we would come up with what machine we wanted to do, and we would go uh, to talk with the salespeople, and they would, we'd say, how much is this machine? And they'd say, that's 50,000 bucks. And we'd say, okay, and we'd just go back and write up our justification for that. And it made it to the plant manager's desk, and the plant manager said, did you guys run this through procurement? And I'm like, what? He says, by the way, we have a whole office full of people who are trained negotiators. Why don't you have them talk to this company and see if we can get that price down? And so I took the information to our procurement person, whose name, I'm not kidding, was Ramey Dingle. Took it to Ramey Dingle, and Ramey's like, let me handle this. Ramey would get these people in the room, and by the time they left, they were just pale, because she'd just taken it all out of them. And so she'd get them talked down from 50000 to 40000 Is that good? Yeah, that extra 10000 is 10000 in shareholder wealth that isn't going away. Does that make sense? excluding taxes and whatnot. Okay, so we get Ramey to negotiate this down to $40,000. That's good news, right? But let's see what it does to our math. Our balance is now negative 40,000 instead of negative 50,000. After year one, we only have 10,000 left to pay off. Have we paid off yet though? Because we know, because we're still negative, right? The next year brings in 20,000 and we jump from minus 10,000 to positive 10,000. Have we broken even? Yeah. Now, are we going to accept the project? Absolutely, because we paid off before time two. But is that gonna be good enough for a multiple choice question on an exam? Absolutely not. So how are you gonna find this? Well, we have a process. Start with the last year that has a negative balance. What's the last year with a negative balance here? 
year one. And so we're going to type that, write one plus. And then we're going to talk about the amount that we still owe. We still owe $10,000 here. Notice I did not use the negative sign. We still owe $10,000. And we're going to divide that by how much money is coming in during the next year. How much money is coming in during year two? 20,000. 10,000 divided by 20,000 is 0.5. 1 plus 0.5 is 1.5. Therefore, we are paying back in 1.5 years. 1.5 years. Now, that little method, though, assumes that the cash flows are uniform throughout year two, meaning that the cash is coming in the same throughout the year. If we look at this, we can see that in year one, the cash flows are coming in or higher, then it gets lower and it gets lower. My guess is that the cash flows are actually higher in the first part of year two than they are at the end of year two, but we don't have enough information to know that for sure, and so we stick with this simple estimation method. Ah, okay. So, how much do we still owe? We still owe ten thousand dollars. If you look at uh, year one minus ten thousand, so that's how much money we still owe. Now, when I put it up here, I'm putting it in terms of positive, the amount of money we owe, instead of negative, the amount of money we don't have. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then I'm dividing by. This 20,000, which is the amount of money we bring in during year two. We know we didn't break even by time one. We know we're gonna break even sometime between time one and time two. And so that's what we're trying to do is figure out how far in between time one and time two. And so it's basically half the year because it's half the remaining or half of the cash flow for the next year that we still owe. Questions? And so we were talking about payback last time and we had worked both of the examples, and I don't know if we have discussed it, but we'll do it now. We're going to find out does the payback and investment rule criteria payback? Oh, sorry, does payback meet our investment rule criteria? First of all, does it account for the time value of money? Any ideas? I'll give you a hint. Did we have to discuss a discount rate? to be able to do? No. So strike one. Does it account for the riskiness of cash flows? No. If it did, it would have to be in, some, in the form of that discount rate, which we don't have. And finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Mr. Bohm, do you think it provides information about the wealth created by the project? He does. Swing and a miss. It doesn't tell us. Does it tell us if it's going to increase or decrease? In fact, we don't know because the only way we would know that for sure, given the same amount of numbers, was to have our discount rate and to calculate the NPV. And so we don't have anything regarding the wealth created by the project. If it were really risky, it could be a negative NPV project. If it were really safe, it could be positive NPV. We just don't know. Questions? Okay, so so far this thing is a big loser. And there is more than that. First of all, we know it doesn't consider the time value of money, but it also doesn't consider the cash flows after payback. Let's take a look at projects A and B. What is the payback? By the way, what's the payback on all of these? I'll give you a hint. It's at the bottom. You don't even have to do the math. Three. So by payback, these would be equally attractive. So we know the payback is telling us that these are all equally attractive. Let's see if that's true. Which would you rather have, project A or project B? B, why? Yeah, you get more money sooner, and uh, time value of money tells us that we would rather get the money sooner rather than later. Okay, so now we know that we would rather have B. Let's look at B and C. In fact, if you look at the first three years of cash flows for B and C, they are exactly identical. Which one would you rather have? C. 
See why? Yeah, I guess you get sixty thousand dollars in the fourth year. Now, a lot of times, or when I used to teach this as a night class, I would have practitioners in the class who had done some projects before, and they would say, "That's total crap. I've never seen a project that looks like C." And they're absolutely right. It's an exaggeration. But here's what I have seen: I have seen a project that would look like B that goes for four years and then stops. And then a project that looks like B only that 60 keeps repeating until the end of time. Which one of those would be worth more? The one that stops or the one that goes to the end of time? Yeah, the one that goes to the end of time. And after I bring that up, then, uh, then the people will, the, the professionals that I'm dealing with usually acknowledge, oh yeah, I've seen those too. And so, even if you don't see something crazy like C, there's still a problem with ignoring the cash flows after the payoff or the payback. Questions? Okay, so we've discussed that this thing is a, uh, it's a toad. But why do people still use it? And by the way, people do. Well, first of all, it's simple. And for small projects, it might be sufficient. I'm going to give you an example from industry. <clears throat> My first manufacturing engineering job, I'm working in a pump factory. And the pump parts, any, any kind of machining requires something called deburring when you get done. You know how when you cut your fingernails, how they're kind of sharp afterwards? And you can actually injure yourself? What do you have to do to keep them from being able to injure you? You file them. And the same is true with these metal parts. And when you machine them, they're going to wind up with these really sharp edges, and it's going to lead to a couple of problems. Number one, it's going to make it hard to get the parts in there. The sharp edges are going to bite into the other metal. And number two, it's going to cut the assembler's hands, and your, your parts are going to be all bloody. Nobody wants that, right? And plus, I don't want to have to fill out the accident report. So, we have to deburr them. I had a guy named Ronnie who was running a lathe, which is a machine that makes round things. And he was making these rings by cutting off sections of a tube. And then as the ring would drop off, he'd catch it on a hook and he'd chink, toss it into a big tub. And then when he got the tub full, he would get the fork truck and he would take it down to a guy named Ralph. And Ralph would uh, sit there with what we called a buzz gun, which is like a, a compressed air powered motor with a piece of sandpaper that goes and he would go bzz, 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 and knock off all the sharp edges. And that's all that Ralph did all day long. And we were paying him $40,000 a year. And that was fairly big money for 1994, especially for Oklahoma. Okay, so one day Ronnie stops me and he says, I've got an idea. I said, what's your idea? He said, if you would get me one of those big vibrating tubs with all the little ceramic cones in it and with the soap and the abrasive, uh, it's, uh, it's a bath. And the, these cones, and while it vibrates, they go and, and he says, I could just toss those rings in there and that machine would deburr them and you could fire Ralph. Now, do you, do you feel that there's another story going on here? Does Ronnie like Ralph? No. Turns out Ralph had made a pass at Ronnie's wife. And Ronnie wasn't digging that. And so Ronnie knew, though, his wife was an intelligent woman. She was not going to go for a man that didn't have a job. And so all he had to do was get Ralph out of the picture at the, at the company. We were the only employer in town. So, boop, good to go, right? Clever, clever. OK. Now, Ronnie says, what do you think? I said, man, I think that's a great idea. And so back then we didn't have the internet like we have it today. So I went and got this big yellow book called the McMaster Car Catalog. And we flipped through and we figured out that it was going to cost us about 15000 to get started on this totally. And that uh, the, the operating expenses were very low after that. And that it was going to save us, of course, Ralph's $40,000 per year. From a payback perspective, the payback was going to be less than one year. Did we really need a net present value analysis to tell us 
that this was a good idea. No, for these small, simple projects, it's a good thing. And by the way, it's simple, and even though Ronnie was an accomplished machinist, and he could do trigonometry, which I bet probably most of you can't, he could do trigonometry, um, he still didn't know how to use the TIBA2+. He didn't know about the time value of money, but he could do this kind of analysis. And so for these little shop floor improvements, these are perfectly fine to use payback on. Would you like to hear how the story ends? Okay, so uh, we, we get the equipment, we get it set up, Ronnie is all smiles, and he says, when are you going to fire Ralph? I said, I've got great news. There was a retirement in another part of the plant, and we're just going to move Ralph over there. I haven't heard from Ronnie since 1994. He's still a little sore at me over not firing Ralph. But the good news is Ronnie's wife did stay with him, so you know, at least there's that. Okay, so it often leads to the same conclusion as NPV. It certainly would have in the example that I just gave you. But here's the important one to me, or the one that I've been involved in the most, and that is it's good for firms with scarce capital and lots of growth opportunities. When I first went to work for Halliburton in 1994, it wasn't a lot of growth opportunities. It was a lot of opportunities for savings because the company was highly inefficient. And so there were a lot of things we could do, like what Ronnie was proposing, that uh, would help us to save a lot of money quickly. However, the company had been underperforming for so long that people didn't want to buy our new stock issues, people didn't want to buy our debt, and so basically the only money we had left to work with was internal equity, which is, you know, addition to retained earnings, which goes to the accumulated retained earnings. That's all we had to work with. So we had a limited amount of capital. We had a boatload of positive MPP projects, but people weren't going to step up with the capital because of our history. And so what did we do? We turned to the payback method. And the guy that came up with our two-year arbitrary thing, I think I told you about him last year, or last time, he was the guy that brought the MRI to commercialization. Really sharp guy. He came up with this two years. He recognized that we had a boatload of opportunities, but we only had a little bit of money. Now, why is the payback good in this situation? The answer is it gets you your money back quickly, so what can you do with it then? Yeah, invest into the next project. And that's, uh, in this way, you can start uh, knocking down these, what we call low-hanging fruit. Do you guys understand the term low-hanging fruit? So let's say you go to visit your grandfather, and your grandfather has an orchard out back, and he says, oh, while you're here, would you go pick me an apple? And you go out to the apple orchard, and there are apples at all levels of the tree, and they all are identically wormy. So it's not going to help you to go higher to get worms. What are you going to do? Or to get rid of worms? What are you going to do? You got to pick the you got to pick the lowest one, right? And so this low hanging fruit are these quick hit projects that can get us a payback very quickly, and they're they're pretty obvious. We go out there and we pick them, and then we are able to use the money we get back out of those to invest in the fruit that's at a slightly higher level. Does that make sense? And so it's going to get harder and harder for us to make progress, but in the beginning, we're going, to, we're going to really do great. Okay. And then it provides quicker feedback on managerial decision making. Let's talk about that. So when I first went to work um, at, uh, at Halliburton, before we got the payback rule, uh, we were doing NPV, and this is what the projections would look like. This is called a hockey stick projection. Any hockey fans in here? No hockey fans. I've got four St. Louis people and no hockey fans. Oh, please. You know what a hockey stick is? Yes. Can you see the hockey stick here? Yes. Okay. So it just it's where it, it ramps up at the end. Now, this project does not seem reasonable at all. In all the years that I did projects, I never saw one that rammed like that. Why is this person making this projection? Because with NPV, all I've got to do is make those cash flows that are way out in the future big enough that I can get a positive NPV out of the project. And you say, why don't they care that they're eventually going to get caught? 
And the answer is this, how long does the average American manager stay in the same job? Five years. Three years. Three! I'm going to clear out of here before, uh, before they figure out this is total crap, right? In fact, I had a colleague named Dan, and he had one of these, and I'm like, dude, you know that's crap. And he's like, yeah, but I'll be out of here by then. Then when we started doing payback, Dan was in a world hurt because his projects were crap. Now, I do have one exception here of a project that is real that looks like that. In fact, I was teaching my China EMBA class this, and some of them work for Wuhan Iron and Steel Company, and they were actually a supplier of metals to the automotive industry. And uh, they said that when they started the new steel production line, for the first three years, they can only sell to the domestic auto suppliers because the Germans and the Japanese require three years worth of run data out of a mill before they'd be willing to buy that steel. Well, after that three years is up then, you start to see this increase in revenue as Volkswagen, Audi, Toyota, Nissan, Honda all start buying their steel from these local Chinese manufacturers, which by the way, they're making the cars there too. It makes perfect sense to do that. And so in that case, you would absolutely see that kind of diagram, but that is the exception. That is rare. And I never saw one of those in all my years of doing this, and I only know of that one case, but that is quite possibly something you should keep an eye out for. Question. Now, discounted payback is something that gets mentioned, and it's where we solve the time value of money problem by discounting those future cash flows. And people say, aha, now we have solved the time value of money problem. But it doesn't solve any of the other problems with the payback method. It doesn't, uh, worry, it doesn't uh, change our concept of the payments after the payoff. So we're going to call it a piece of junk and we're going to, I'm going to tell you why. It requires the same ingredients as a net present value plus this arbitrary cutoff. So I'm going to tell you about something that my mom used to do. She used to take these lovely ingredients and I love all of these individually very much. Hamburger, eggs, crackers, and ketchup. And she would make something called meatloaf. You guys ever have meatloaf? There's going to be like two people or maybe three in here that like meatloaf. Raise your hands. It's good, good. Damn. So we got one, two, three, four. Uh, okay, and, and people always say, oh, you just haven't had good meatloaf. I'm like, that's because it doesn't exist. Back to the story. Now, this, is, this thing is meatloaf. If you take good ingredients and you combine them into crap, which is what this is, it's meatloaf and you don't want it. So don't do that. Don't do that. Now, am I going to require you to know how to do this thing? If you can promise me that you can remember the meatloaf speech for your boss in case they ask you to do this, can you do that? Sure. Very good then I will not require you to know anything about discounted payback. Does that sound fair? Yeah, so if, if you know, your boss throws this out, you can say, yeah, my finance professor said that sucks. And if he asks why, then you can tell him about meatloaf. Questions? Whew, now we're on to something called average accounting return. And it turns out there's only one thing in this world that accountants like more than numbers, and that is words. Let me prove it to you. This is defined as the average project earnings after taxes and depreciation divided by the average book value of the investment over its life. You know what that sounds like? It's actually <coughs> average net income from the project divided by average book value. And that's what they're going to use here. So uh, would you put that top thing on your note sheet? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, so what do we need here? We need projected accounting earnings. 
we need the investment amount and a depreciation schedule. Remember, they say we're going to need this average book value. We've got to have depreciation to calculate earnings, net income. We've got to have depreciation to calculate book value. And we need a minimum acceptable AAR. And that is an arbitrary cutoff, just like the pay, pay, payback requirement. We have to just kind of come up with what that should be. Now, in this case, it's not the vice president of manufacturing that comes up with it. It's probably some account that comes up with it. And what is our rule? It's to accept all projects with AAR greater than or equal to the minimum AAR. And keep in mind, there's that equal sign there. So let's look at an example. And here they've been nice enough to calculate the net incomes for us, but you can see how they're come up with. And let's talk about this, this item and how we know what it's worth. By the way, unless you're told otherwise, you're always to assume that we depreciate straight line to zero over the life of the project. Unless you're told otherwise, you're always to assume that we depreciate straight line to zero over the life of the project. And by looking at these depreciations of $100,000 a year, and knowing that assumption, I think that we are investing in something that costs $500,000. So that's going to come into use here in a minute. Now, on an exam, I would give that to you. I would give that to you. I wouldn't make you figure it out from looking at things like this. Okay, we know it's going to be average net income over average book value. And so the average net income is really easy. We just take all of those numbers, add them together, and divide by what? The amount of years. And how many years do we have net income? Five. And so we're going to divide by five here and see that our average net income is $50,000. Now, for average investment or average book value, we have to figure out the book value for each and every year. And remember that book value is the initial or historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. Book value is the initial or historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. You could also say that book value in the next period is equal to, or book value in the current period is equal to book value from the prior period minus the current period depreciation. And so we could just move along, and you'll see that more when we get to chapter eight. But for our purposes here, <clears throat> we know we've got a machine that's $500,000. We're going to be depreciating it $100,000 every year. So <clears throat> when we purchase the machine, how much depreciation has been charged against it? Zero. Zero. Very good. And so our first book value is going to be that full $500,000. Now, how do we figure the book value for the next year? Well, it's the previous book value of $500,000 minus the current depreciation of 100,000 gives us 400,000. And we keep doing that every year. We subtract another 100,000 and the book value keeps going down until it reaches zero at the end. Because remember, we were depreciating to zero book value, which is our assumption. And then we add all those book values together and divide by what? Six. Why six and not five? Yeah, that time zero? We didn't have a time zero net income, but we do have a time zero book value. Does that make sense? Okay, now I want to point something super easy out to you that'll save you a lot of time on exams. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, on an exam, I would actually give it to you, but knowing the assumption, that we are going to depreciate this thing to zero over its life. And up here, if we look at depreciation, if you add all those together, what do they add up to? Yeah, 500,000. But I would tell you that on an exam. I, would, I wouldn't do that to you. Okay. Now, let's see. Uh, we just discussed that you got to have six of these. Oh, well, yeah, I was going to give you a way to make your life easier, but go ahead. Would, would you always do N plus 1? Yeah, because they're always so. It's always going to be one to n okay. up here, and it's always going to be zero, zero to n down right. here. So okay. it's a total of n plus one. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Now, 
Uh, you say, that's a boatload of work and I don't want to do that and I don't blame you. Let me tell you a secret. If you take a straight line depreciation to zero over the life of the investment, the average book value is always precisely one half of the initial investment. Let me say that one more time. If you are straight line depreciating to zero over the life of the project, the average investment or average book value will always be exactly one half of the initial investment. And so when you're looking at the examples and you see that the solution says 500,000 divided by two, don't freak out. They know that because they are straight line depreciating to zero, that the average is just gonna be one half of the initial amount. Doesn't that sound like a whole lot easier than trying to figure out each of these book values and add them together and divide by n plus one? Yeah, make your life easier. Don't hurt yourself. Okay, so let's assume that the arbitrary cutoff for our AAR is 20%, and here we have 50,000 divided by 250,000 gives us 20%. Do we accept or reject the project? They're exactly the same. Do we accept or reject the project? We accept it because remember the rule is greater than or equal to. Questions? Now something else they point out here is that we have a negative tax situation over here. In the real world, if you lose money, does the government write you a check? No. You can do what are called tax loss carry forwards, and if I were an accountant, I would be able to explain those to you fully, but I'm not. Um, but I will tell you this. We always make the assumption that the projects that we do are added on to an otherwise profitable firm. So what does that mean? It means that the negative taxes here are merely going to offset some positive taxes somewhere else. So we still will have the money. It's just not going to be sent to us in a check by the government just because of this project. Does that make sense? Governments are usually not in the habit of sending checks out to people. You guys have been spoiled with your COVID relief checks, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that gravy train is going to come to an end and then maybe people will actually go to work again and you can get a burger, right? Do you guys see how that works? If I give you money, what's your incentive to go to work? There is none. Hey, and, and I'm, I, I've admitted to you before, I am a scumbag. If the university would pay me and told me I didn't have to worry about doing anything, would I do that? Absolutely. I'd be home right now playing with my dogs, right? So, that's a little aside there, but don't continue to expect the government to keep handing out money because it can't go on forever. Now, let's ask this question. Does it account for the time value of money? Ms. Herdman. No, she says, we did not have a discount rate here, and for crying out loud, we're not even using real cash flows, are we? Is net income a real cash flow? Oh, come on. Say it out loud. Is net income a real cash flow? No, it's got all sorts of non-cash crap in it, including depreciation and deferred taxes. So we know that can't be correct. Okay, so it doesn't account for the time value. It doesn't account for the riskiness of the cash flows. And on occasion, I will have a smart alecky accountant. They're rare, but they exist. Say, well, you know, for a riskier project, certainly we would require a higher AAR. And I say, poo, great. Tell me what scientific laboratory that you have used to determine this correct AAR. Because, you know, we have the markets to tell us what a correct discount rate is. What do you schmoes have to tell you what a correct AAR is? And they say, uh, 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 right? It's, they don't have one. So it doesn't account for the riskiness of the cash flows. It doesn't provide any information regarding the wealth created by the project. No, no way. Remember, if we're, if we're not looking at the time value of money and we're not looking at riskiness, there's no way we could be telling you anything about the wealth created by the project. So how many stars are we gonna give A, A, R? Zero. Zero, very good. So, 
Why do people still use AAR? Well, the numbers are readily available and people are lazy. Let, you, let me tell you what I mean about the numbers being readily available. My first accountant was a man named Jack. Jack was the only person in the business unit that lacked either a roommate, an office mate, or a window. And so it was just like Jack alone in his cave with his fluorescent lights and his spreadsheets. And so he's basically starved of human interaction. And so the way you could make Jack's day was to go to his door and say, Jack, I need some numbers. And here's what Jack would do, <laughs> right? Jack perks up, what can I do? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, got this project. He's like, not a problem. Gets to work on a spreadsheet, happiest he's been in days. And I'm lazy, right? And so he gives, gives me these numbers. Number two, it's easy to calculate. Did we need to use the TIBA2 plus? Absolutely not. You could do this on any cheap calculator, maybe even in your head. Now, so far, those first two number, those first two reasons are not legitimate ones. The third one has the smell of legitimacy about it. Stockholders and media pay attention to accounting measures of returns, ROE and ROA. And if you look at AAR, it's actually related to ROA because the top is basically net income and the bottom is the total assets of the project. And so it's really kind of net income over total, uh, total assets and so it kind of looks like ROA. And so you might think, well, wait a minute, if as long as I only accept projects with RO or with AAR greater than or equal to my current ROA, I will continue to grow my ROA and that's good for the investors. But here's the problem. The problem is that ROA, that is, you're not taking account of the risk. Certainly a riskier project would have a higher return on assets. Examples, two different products you could import from Mexico. Uh, number one, <coughs> avocados. ROA, maybe 10%. Product number two, cocaine. What do you think the ROA is on that? Yeah, it's huge, right? Now, so under, under our thinking here, if your current ROA was 12% and you had this opportunity to choose between 10%, well, you'd reject the avocados, right? Even though that's a fairly safe thing to do, you'd be jumping on the cocaine bandwagon. Now, should you sell drugs? Absolutely not. And I just use it as an example. But my point to you is this. Projects that are inherently risky have, tend to have higher ROAs. So we can't always use that as a good criteria for choosing. And the final reason is the one that I encounter, and that is sometimes your boss is an accountant. I worked for a company that had always been ran by people who came up through operations. And then we got a CEO, for whatever reason, uh, that came from an accounting background. And suddenly we have to start doing AAR. And why do we have to do AAR? Because the boss is an accountant. Now let me talk to you about what happens when your boss asks you to do a project with AAR. So they say, look, I want you to look at this new project. If it's got an AAR greater than 12%, we're going to accept it. You say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And you walk away and you do the project and you see that the AAR doesn't clear 12% or that it does clear 12%. Should you immediately say to your boss, it's great, let's accept the project. No, you should do an NPV and if NPV is positive, then you go back and the AAR is about 12%. You go back and you say, boss, you're a genius. That project returns 13% AAR. We should definitely go for it. Now, what if the AAR came out low, but the NPV came out positive? Well, you go back and say, look, boss, AAR says to reject this project, but NPV says to accept it. Or what's worse is AAR says to accept it, and NPV says to reject it. And in that case, your boss says, I don't care about NPV, AAR is above the cutoff, we go forward. What do you say? 
Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And then you go immediately to your desk. Now, this is, I'm, I'm, keep in mind, we're going back to 1990, probably about six at this point, seven. And uh, we didn't have neat things like uh, iPhones and things. So what, I had a paper log book in my desk. And I would open my paper log book and I would say, today, Bill asked me to look at replacing machine 236 with a minimum AAR of 12%. The project was AAR 13%, but the NPV was dramatically negative at $10,000. I informed Bill of this. Bill told me to go pack sand. Um, so we proceed. Now, I shut the book. I put it in the drawer. When do you think I pull the book out again on this topic? Yeah, when everything goes south, they come to me and they're like, hey, Haggard, see your name on the paperwork for this dog crap project. What kind of freaking idiot are you? I say, whoop, whoop, and I pull out my logbook, and I read the passage to them, and they say, oh, now, what's their next stop? My boss. Now, Bill's got to explain the best possible outcome from all this. He gets fired, she gets fired, you get to take their job, right? Now, what's the moral to the story? It's better to be employed than to be right, right? But let me say that that's true except for one exception. Well, actually, I guess there are many exceptions. But so let's think about what if it's, if what they're asking you to do is immoral, then you're better off to go ahead and be right than to be employed. I'll give you, uh, and I'll try to make it relatively uh, nondescript here so I can put it out on the internet. I worked for a company, and they were making a product, and this product required heat treatment, and it was the first time these people had ever done it. And I had been doing it for a long time in the oil field. Well, we, uh, we were heat treating the stuff, and it was getting cracks in it. And if this stuff failed, people could die. And so when they started bringing this stuff into my plant, I paid for the equipment and trained my people to test for the cracks. They didn't know to do that. And so then these parts were coming to me and they were all cracked. And I quarantined them. And of course that means that we can't ship any product because these were parts that go into the product we ship. I get called up to the director of operations office. He says, Haggard, what the hell are you doing? I said, those parts are dangerous. If they go into our product, people will die. What can he say? Can he say, no, send them out anyway, right? Because at this point, I could have reported them to the appropriate regulatory agency, right? But what you need to know is that was the beginning of my end with my relationship with that company. One way or the other, whether it was my choice or their choice, I was on the way out the door. But you know what? I slept really well. What if I helped this guy put the dangerous stuff out there? Could you live with yourself? I couldn't. So in that case, it's better to be right and to be employed. Does that make sense? If we're just talking about losing a little money and maybe your boss losing his job, just say yes ma'am, yes sir, and march forward. Questions? So now we're on to the internal rate of return. This is an important definition, so definitely circle it, put a star by it. IRR is the discount rate that makes the net present value or NPV of a project zero. So we're just looking at, we're going to look at the project and whatever rate we can put in there that makes that NPV zero, that is the IRR or internal rate of return. And so our rule here is to accept all the projects with an IRR greater than the appropriate discount rate. And by the way, that appropriate discount rate is exactly the same rate that we have for NPV. That discount rate is exactly the same rate that we have for NPV. It's determined by the riskiness of the project. That's what chapter 12 was all about. Okay, now, if it's a set of of, of the usual cash flows where we start at negative and it goes positive, then this IRR 
is going to be, uh, the MPV will be positive when IRR is, a gr is greater than the appropriate discount rate, and IRR will be, or MPV will be negative when IRR is below the appropriate discount rate. And what will MPV be when IRR is exactly equal to the discount rate? Zero. Very good. Thank you. So what do we need for IRR? We need the initial investment amount. Sounds familiar. We need the future cash flows and their timing. Sounds familiar. And as I just mentioned, we need that discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. These are exactly the same ingredients that we need for NPV. They are exactly the same ingredients. And so you might be thinking, if this doesn't turn out to be perfect, that I'm going to make some sort of meatloaf speech. We shall see. So here's our simple IRR example. You got a project that'll pay 110 one year from today for an investment of $100 today. What's the IRR? Well, it's really easy. Minus 100 plus the present value of that 110, which is just 110 divided by 1 plus R. Remember that IRR is the discount rate that makes NPV equal to zero. So we said NPV equal to zero and we solve for R. And it's really not hard here. We can do that basically in our heads and figure out that it's just 10%. But it's really not that simple because if you're looking in the real world, do you think you just have one cash flow? No. Oh, so here's what it would look like. So you have zero equal the initial investment, negative initial investment, plus uh, your cash flow one, divided by one plus R, plus cash flow two, divided by one plus R to the second, plus cash flow three, divided by one plus R to the third. And we could go on and on and on. Now, do I have any mathematical geniuses in here? No? No? Okay. Um, well, I'm not a mathematical genius either, but I do have enough education to know that solving that for R basically can't be done. Basically can't be done. And so we end up having to search for it through something called iteration. Iteration is a fancy word for repeated guessing. Repeated guessing. And so I throw my first guess in for R, and if this ends up being negative, if MPV ends up being negative, that means I've guessed too high because it makes these things smaller. If this ends up being positive, then I know I've guessed too low because these things are too big compared to the initial investment. And so I have to keep going back and forth until I home in on that zero. This is how we used to solve heat exchange stuff in mechanical engineering. And to try to do that during an exam, can you imagine? And your ability to succeed or fail really had a lot to do with how good was your first guess. Would I do that to you? No. No, we had the TIBA2+. And the TIBA2+, is actually a great guesser. It's a much better guesser than you'll ever be. And it's a much faster guesser than you'll ever be. And when we do the calculation here and we compute IRR on your calculator, I want you to watch and see the delay. When we compute an NPV on your calculator, it pops up immediately. When we compute an IRR on your calculator, it actually takes a while because the calculator is in there doing guessing. So something to watch out for as we move forward. Questions so far? So. We have here an IRR example. An investment of $200 today gets you $100 per year for the next three years. We want to know what is the IRR. And the answer is we use our calculator. So get your calculator up. And we're going to use, oh, I need to pull my calculator up. Okay, here we go. 
Investment of $200 today gets you $100 for the next three years. We're going to say CF. Second, clear work. Why do we have to do that? Ms. Herdman, why do we have to do that? Yeah, if we had something in there that went beyond C01, that stuff would still be in there. Okay, so time zero, we have that initial investment of 200. We've got to put a negative on it because it's a cash flow out. We're going to hit enter, arrow down. C01, they tell us is 100. Enter, arrow down. How many times in a row does that cash flow happen? Three. So we're going to say three, enter, and that's uh, that it. That's it. That's F01. Now, here's an easy question. What button should I hit to compute IRR? IRR, thank you. IRR. Now, it's by the way, is IRR zero? No. What's it telling me to do right here? Compute. Compute. So I'm going to hit CPT, and I get 23.375%. And I hope, hopefully you, read, you watched when it was computing, and you saw the time that it takes. It doesn't show up on my simulator because I've got a very powerful processor here. Your processor is slightly less powerful, right? By the way, did you know we put a man on the moon with a computer that was actually slightly less sophisticated than your TIB82 Plus? Isn't that crazy? Would you trust your life to a computer slightly less sophisticated than it? No, you can't even trust yours during the exam, right? Okay, back to the story. What does that mean? Well, if the appropriate discount rate was 20%, would we accept or reject the project? Yeah, we'd accept it because the discount rate's lower than the IRR. If the discount rate was 25%, we would reject. Okay, so let's ask these uh, ask our three questions. Number one, does it account for the time value of money? Yes. Yeah, check it out. Present value each and every year. Number two, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? Yes. Yes, how? Yeah, the discount rate that we judge, uh, we compare IRR to. So yes, it does. Number three, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. Raise your hand if you're awake but don't care. Okay, so, mm. so you, you guys are kind of undecided here. Well, let me tell you that I would accept both yes and no, and here's why. If the IRR is greater than the appropriate discount rate, then we know that we are creating wealth, but we don't know how much. We don't know how much. So let me say that one more time. If the IRR is greater than the discount rate, then we know we are creating wealth. We just don't know how much. And so I'm going to give this one two and a half stars out of three. Two and a half stars out of three. It doesn't do quite as good a job as NPV, but it is, it's up there. Now we know it's not perfect though, and we know we've got the the uh, we've got some other problems here we need to talk about. The first problem is independent versus mutually exclusive projects. Independent projects, accepting one has nothing to do with accepting the other. So, uh, let's compare that to mutually exclusive projects. If I do one, I can't do the other. If I do one, I can't do the other. And so, let's say maybe that you had two projects in mind, uh, completing your MBA and becoming a professional roller derby player. Do you guys know roller derby? Pretty violent, kind of weird, right? Okay, so those are independent projects. Could you do them both at the same time? Absolutely you could. You could study by night, study by day, you could skate by night. You could do that. In fact, we have athletes in this class that are proving that you can do athletics and get an MBA at the same time. So those are independent projects. But what about mutually exclusive projects? Let's talk about mutually exclusive projects. In the United States, by law, you're not allowed to be married to any more than one person at a time. Did you guys know that? 
Okay, very good. Okay, so what does that mean? It means marriage is a mutually exclusive project. Since I'm married to my wife, I can't marry someone else, right? I can't do both at the same time. And I can tell you I don't understand why people want more than one wife anyway. <laughs> I love my wife, but one is plenty, right? Okay, so mutually exclusive project. Let me give you another example that maybe hits closer to home. You uh, applied to Missouri State University's MBA program. Undoubtedly, you also applied to Harvard and undoubtedly you were accepted at both locations, you had to choose between them, right? You had to choose between them. Now, I've got great news for you. You made the right call because we are much more affordable. I've already proven to you that your education is better than what you would get at Harvard, and the school colors are even the same, so far as I recall. So you're good to go, right? And by the way, you don't have to live in Oh, bless you. That was a very strange sneeze. <laughs> I was thinking it was a, a, a sound of confusion or hatred, but it was just a sneeze. Not hatred. Disagreement. How about that? No. Okay, now let's, let's talk one more time about sneezes. If you keep stifling your sneezes like that, you're eventually going to explode, right? And let them go. Is that true? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. So uh, look it up on the internet. I guess we'll find I'm out. I'm sure we'll know if it's true if you find a case on the internet. Okay, now, when does IRR let us down? IRR lets us down when we look at mutually exclusive projects. It'll be just fine for independent projects, but it'll let us down for a mutually exclusive, exclusive projects. And let's explain why that is. I'm going to give you an example. We own a, a street corner lot in Los Angeles. It's totally, totally vacant, and it's in a really great part of town, if there is such a thing in Los Angeles, a really great part of town. And we are looking at two projects. We can do one or the other, but we can't do both. So by definition, they are mutually exclusive. Project number one, or A, is a snow cone stand. By the way, do you think Southern California would be a good place for a snow cone stand? Oh yeah, it's hot, it's dry, and it's basically that way year-round, so you could sell a lot of snow cones there. So this makes sense. And the initial investment for the snow cone stand is 100, and then we have three payments of 50 every year after that. Project B is a swanky nightclub. Do you guys know the word swanky? What does swanky mean? Yeah, glitzy is, is, is really nice, right? So I asked that same question to my class in Mississippi. And I asked, does anyone know what swanky is? And this girl volunteered, and I said yes. And she said, slutty? <laughs> I said, no, that's skanky, but thanks for trying. Swing and a miss. OK, swanky nightclub. It's going to cost us an initial investment of 1000 but it's going to return 450 for three years after that. And so we are going to look at these both with IRR and with MPV, and we're going to see if they arrive at the same decision. So get your calculator out. CF, second, clear work. What should I put in for CF0 for Project A? Yeah, 100 minus enter arrow down. What is C01? 50. Enter arrow down. What do I put in for F01? 3. Very good. 3. Enter. And now I'm going to hit IRR and compute. And I want you to write that number down under IRR, 23.375%. By the way, does that number look familiar? That was the answer to the last one. Yeah, that was the one we found on the last one. And you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, they aren't exactly the same cash flows. They're not. But the ratios are the same. The first payment is twice the size of, or the times zero is twice the size of times one, two, and three. And times one, two, and three are all equal, and there aren't any more beyond that. And as long as you have that situation, you will always get the same IRR. 
So it could be 1 million, 500,000, 500,000, 500,000, you would get the same answer. It could be 2 million, or minus 2 million, 1 million, 1 million, 1 million, you would get exactly the same answer every, every time. Questions? Okay, now while we have that in our calculator, let's go ahead and figure out NPV. What would I, what button would I have to get NPV? NPV! Now, something I haven't told you yet. The required rate of return for snow cone stands and nightclubs is exactly the same. They're exactly the same risk. And so we're looking at 10% here. So we're going to put in 10. Enter, arrow down, and then we're going to compute. I'm getting 24.34. Does that sound right? Go ahead and write that down. Write that down. That's why I give you this little box to write this stuff down. Okay, now we are on to the nightclub. I'm going to hit clear, CF, second, clear work. What do I put in for CF0 for the nightclub? Yeah, 1000, negative. Enter, arrow down. What is C01? 450. Enter, arrow down. What is F01? 3. Very good. 3. Enter. Now, I'm going to hit IRR and compute. I'm getting 16.65%. 16.65%. The last one was, what, 23.38% or something like that? If we were using IRR to decide between these two projects, which one would we choose? Yeah, we would choose A. It's got the higher IRR. And you would feel really good about that until we calculate NPV. Let's do that. NPV. We're going to put in our 10%. Enter. Arrow down. And compute. I'm getting 119.08. Is 119.08 greater than 24.34? Yes. What's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth. Which one of these projects is going to do a better job of maximizing shareholder wealth? B. Now let's talk about why this is. Remember earlier I told you as long as the ratios of the payments are exactly the same, you'll get exactly the same return? IRR fails to take into account the magnitude of the investment. It fails to take into account the magnitude of investment. Sure, we can get a higher return on the snow cone stand, but we can only invest 100 there. We can invest 1,000 in the nightclub at a slightly lower uh, rate, actually, what, two-thirds, and still end up having greater increase in shareholder wealth, simply because we were able to invest a greater amount of money in that project. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, the required rate of return for the last question was 10%. Should we always like, assume that it'll be 10%? No, I'll tell you. I just didn't put it on the slide. That's why I went ahead and told you. And did the riskiness have to be the same between those two projects? Absolutely not. We could have had. Uh, this, the, and it probably would be that the nightclub would be riskier than the snow cone stand. You know, how many people usually die of alcohol poisoning at a snow cone stand? Pretty low. How many people get shot at snow cone stands? Not as many as get shot at nightclubs. Do you see the, yeah, okay. Good point, thank you. Okay, now another problem is multiple IRRs. Remember that we get an IRR any time the NPV is equal to zero because that IRR is by definition a discount rate that makes NPV equal to zero. If we have these unconventional cash flows, which means more than one sign change, then we have, uh, we're going to have more than one IRR because we get an IRR for every sign change. 
and I'll show you that the math here in a minute. But let's talk about what this looks like. Well, we know that in the beginning, our investment's got to be negative, right? We've got to put money into this thing before we get anything out. And so that's always negative. And then we could have one or more years of positive cash flow. And at the very end, a negative cash flow. That's going to be two sign changes going from negative to positive, and then one going from positive to negative. What if I had negative, negative, <laughs> negative, and then positive to the end of time? That's still just one cash, one sign change, right? And so you'd be perfectly fine using IRR for that. Now you say, wait a minute, what kind of weird project would have cash flows like this? I'm going to give you two examples. Number one, in the United States, when we mine coal, how do we do it? We go in and we knock the top off the mountain. This is the new way, not the old way. You knock the top off the mountain and you dig the coal out. And then at the end, the United States government makes you do something really weird. Do you know what they make you do? Rebuild a mountain. Do you think rebuilding mountains is cheap? No, we have to restore this to its natural, pristine, blah, 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 right? Okay, so what does that mean? It means we've got a huge investment as we push the top off the mountain. It means we get positive cash flows as we sell the coal coming out of the mine. And then we have a negative cash flow at the end as we return it to its natural and pristine condition. Example number two. Have you guys seen here in town where they basically go in and tear down old gas stations and put in a new one? Usually, I don't know what they're going to knock down, but whatever's going to spring up is most likely going to be a come and go, right? And so, uh, by the way, don't hang out at come and go at night. You'll get shot. Back to the story. <laughs> I'm just going by what I read in the newspaper. Okay. Back to the story. Um, when you tear down an old gas station, the United States government makes you do something very interesting. They make you dig up the old tanks. By the way, the gasoline in the ground is stored in tanks. Uh, I worked with a girl in, in Louisiana, and she, she said, how do they know where to put the gas stations? How do they know where the gasoline's at in the ground? I'm like, really? It's in a big freaking tank. They put it there. OK, back to the story. They make you dig out the, the tank, and then they make you dig out all the dirt from around the tank. Why do you think they make you do that? Yeah. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's permanent, right? Over time, there's going to be corrosion. There's going to be leakage. And so basically, you have to pull out these old tanks, and you're going to send them off, and you're also going to pull up the dirt around there, and you're going to send it to be ran through probably an incinerator to get rid of any remaining hydrocarbons. And then you can start putting in your new tank along with some new dirt and your, your recycled dirt if you happen to get any back. Now, what does that mean? It means if I'm going to go out there and build a new come-and-go gas station, then I'm going to have a big investment up front. And then over the years, as people come in and buy beer, cigarettes, lottery tickets, and gasoline, which are like the big four at the convenience store, um, then we'll have positive cash flows. And at the very end, what are they going to make me do? They're going to make me dig up those tanks. And so building a convenience store that had gasoline would also have this kind of set of cash flows. Questions? OK, so let's take a look at what this does. So what we've got here in the picture is an NPV profile. On the horizontal axis, we have discount rate. On the vertical axis, we have NPV. And when we plot out NPV here, we can see that it's negative below 10%. It's positive between 10 and 20%. And then uh, it goes negative again after 20%. If we were told that our discount rate was 10%, and this thing was returning, let's see, let me. So, where are our IRRs here in this picture? By the way, what's the definition of IRR? I told you it would come back handy, right? It's at NPV at, at well, whatever, at NPV, NPV equals zero. Yeah, very so good. And so, we've got two places up here where NPV is equal to zero. What are they? 
10 and 20. Okay, so if our discount rate, if our uh, IRR is 10 and our discount rate is 8, would we accept the project? So if the discount Sorry. rate... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if the discount rate is 8 and our IRR is 10, then we would accept the project. But if we look at the NPV where the discount rate is 8, is it positive or negative? negative? It's negative. So we should be rejecting there. Does that make sense? And then if we have a discount rate between 10 and 20, our IRR um, is going to be less than the discount rate. Let's see, if I yeah, if I have a discount rate between 10 and 20, and the IRR is 10 percent, as we're seeing here, then I would be rejecting in that range. Should I be by NPV accepting or rejecting there? NPV is positive. We should accept, right? And so what I'm telling you is, it makes you make the wrong decision. Now, once you get out past 20%, then uh, your, your uh, IRR is lower than the discount rate, so you would reject, and your NPD is negative, so you would reject. So the only place you get the correct answer is if your discount rate were higher than 20%. Does that make sense? Now, do you need to remember all of that? Absolutely not. Here's what you need to remember. When you see more than one sign change, do not use IRR. Let me say that one more time. When you see more than one sign change, do not use IRR because of the multiple IRR problem. You're going to have more than one. It'll lead to bad decisions. In those cases, you're going to use N. NPV. NPV always gives you the right answer, assuming you've put good numbers into it and done it correctly. But in this case, IRR can lead you astray. And by the way, we already have the information, don't we? We already have the initial uh, cash flow, we already have future cash flows and their timing, and we already have the rate appropriate to the risk. And so we have enough information to do NPV if we had enough information to do this IRR. Does that make sense? Okay. So, we said IRR is a two and a half star measure. It's got problem with mutually exclusive projects. It's got a problem with uh, more than one sign change or multiple IRRs. And so, the question is, why do people still use it? And the answer is, because it sums up the project in a single number that people can relate to. I'll give you an example. Um, let's see, uh, marketing people, raise your hands. I'm gonna pick on you. Okay, so, by the way, do you know that, where, where do you think most CEOs come from? Do you think they come from finance or from marketing? Marketing, and it makes sense. Number one, they actually like people. Number two, <laughs> number two is, they actually have a broader view of the market which is important because the CEO needs to have vision about where the company needs to go in, within the product market, right? Finance, we don't. We don't, and that's fine. And so you're likely to have a, a CEO that's a marketing person or someone that came out of sales. Now, perfectly intelligent people, but I'm going to ask you a very personal question. Do you think you'll remember NPV 10 years from now? No. Probably not. Probably not. And so if I come into her office and I'm prattling on about a positive NPV project, she's going to say, well, I don't know. And, and then I'll say, well, wait a minute. The IRR of this project is 17%. And she says, aha, she knows that she's getting 12% on a retirement plan. Her house loan is 6% and her car loan is 7%. And she knows that this return is greater than all of those. Right? And so it gives us an intuitive feel for the project that we can compare versus other numbers. Now, you got to be careful though, because what if the project is extraordinarily risky, like importing cocaine from Mexico? Yeah, the IRR could be really high, but it might be lower than 
the discount rate that's required for that risk. Don't mention the IRR to your boss if NPV is negative, unless the, the IRR is so low that it makes it makes sense that they would want to blow off the project anyway. So only mention IRR when you're trying to get a positive NPV project accepted. And then finally, if the IRR is high enough, you might not even need to find that appropriate discount rate. So we've got a company pickup truck. And this company truck is an old piece of junk and it needs a lot of maintenance. And as a result, the uh, IRR of replacing the company truck is 45%. Do I really need to know whether the appropriate discount rate is 7% or 11%? No. 45% on something which is reasonably safe, like buying a pickup truck, uh, I don't need to know that discount rate. That IRR is high enough. Now, if the IRR came down to being something like 9%, then I would need to know, is it 7 or is it 11? But when it's 45%, we don't need to worry about that. Does that make sense? Okay, that is where we're going to stop for today. Next time, we will start talking about the profitability index. For sure, bring your chapter eight slides next time. Okay, let's do a little review here. Uh, we, so what are some of the rules we've talked about so far? Someone just throw one out. Say again? A-R, A-A-R. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to get confused. That is so strange that she picked that one. That's just a, that's a weird one. I appreciate your, your out-of-the-box thinking here. Now, what's AAR stand for? <coughs> Very good, average accounting return. And uh, does it use uh, real cash flows? No. no. Does it account for the time value of money? No. Does it account for the riskiness of the project? <laughs> does it uh, give us any idea whether wealth is created or destroyed? No. Total piece of crap. Okay, um, and why do people still possibly use it? Lazy. They're lazy. Sometimes your boss is an accountant. We said it was related potentially to ROA, but we said that's not necessarily a very smart argument. Okay, someone throw out another one, please. IRR, and what is the definition? I'm not gonna pick on you since you came up with it. What does that stand for, by the way? Very good, internal rate of return. And what did we say IRR was? Ms. Hill. I was going to say zero. Yeah, it's the discount rate that makes NPV equal to zero. So that's IRR. Does IRR use real cash flows? Yeah. Does it account for the time value of money? Yes. Does it account for the riskiness of the project? Yes, through the discount rate, right? Okay, now we said there was, a, there was a little problem on the accounting for wealth created because we said we know whether we're creating or destroying, but we don't know how much. Now, can anyone tell me a problem with IRR? Yeah, mutually exclusive projects. We said if you've got two projects and you can only do one of them, should you use IRR? No, and the reason is because it fails to take into account the scale of the investment. Because if you can invest a bunch of money at a slightly lower rate of return, it's gonna have a higher NPV than a tiny project at a slightly higher rate of return. So always use NPV when you're looking at uh, mutually exclusive projects. What else? What's the other big problem with IRR? Yeah, more than one sign change gives us multiple IRRs and if you start making decisions based on that, I showed you how in two of the three regions on that example, it'll give you the wrong answer. So you don't want to do that. Okay, someone throw out another one. I've been mentioning another one as we go along here. Yeah, NPV, net present value. And does it use real cash flows? Yes. Does it account for risk? Yeah. Does it account for the time value of money? Yes. Does it give us an estimate of the wealth created? Yeah, dollars and cents. And so we said NPV is our gold standard. What's another one we looked at? Payback. Yeah, payback. 
Uh, payback, does it use real cash flows? It does use real cash flows. Um, that wasn't one of our three questions though, right? The only reason I throw that real cash flows in is because she kicked off on AAR and it's not real cash flows, right? Net income's not. Okay, so payback does use real cash flows, but does it account for the time value? No. no. Does it account for the risk of the project? No. Does it give us any idea how much wealth is created? No. Um, does it, let's see, what are, what are some problems that we see with it? We've already said it doesn't account for time value of money. What was the other one we said about? What happens after pay, do we, does it analyze anything after payback? No. So if you've got a lot of cash coming in after the payback on one project but not on another, payback might make them look equally attractive when in fact one of them is far more attractive than the other. Okay. Um, what about discounted? I discounted uh, payback. What? It's meatloaf, right? You take a lot of good stuff and you turn it into crap. Don't do it. Stay away from it. And memorize that speech for your boss when they bring that up. Okay. Well, I am pleased that you guys remembered as much as you did. So now let's move on to profitability index or PI. And the profitability index is defined at, man, you'd think that accountants came up with this. Present value of cash flow subsequent to initial investment. What does subsequent to mean? What are your plans <coughs> subsequent to your graduation? It's after, subsequent, after. Okay, so after your initial investment, the present value of those cash flows after initial investment, divide by the initial investment. Now note, this thing assumes that all the initial investment happens at time zero. It just assumes that implicitly. Okay, now that is a lot of words there, but remember that the way our book defines uh, NPV, it is the present value of cash flow subsequent to an initial investment minus the initial investment. And so we can just rearrange that definition to come up with the present value of cash flow subsequent to initial investment equals initial investment plus NPV. And we just do a little substitution there. And something magical happens when I divide initial investment by initial investment. What happens? One. Yeah, you get one. And the rest of that is just NPV over initial investment. And so this is the formula I would encourage you to put on your note sheet. This is the formula I would encourage you to put on your note sheet. And you also need to make a big old note that says initial investment here is positive. Initial investment here is positive. Initial investment in this formula is positive. Should we put in a negative sign on the initial investment here? No. Very good. Okay. Now, what is the rule? Well, we can actually use the NPV rule to come up with our rule for PI. What's the rule for accepting or rejecting projects with NPV? Oh, come on. What's that? Yeah, if it's NPV is positive, right? Yeah. Greater than zero then we should accept that project. Well, if I put anything greater than zero, what, by the way, what if I just put zero in here? PI would be, no, what's one plus zero? One. 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 Very good. If I just put zero in here for NPV, PI would be one, and so anything greater than zero NPV is gonna give me a PI greater than one, and that is our investment rule. Accept all projects with PI greater than one. Okay, so so far you're saying, wait a minute, this thing actually requires us to do NPV before we can even do it. Why would we be using this? Well, we'll get to that here in a little bit. So what do we need for PI? First of all, we need the initial investment amount at time zero. We need the future cash flows and their timing. And we need the discount rate appropriate to the risk. That looks exactly like what we need for NPV because it is exactly what we need for NPV. So let's ask ourselves this about PI. Does it account for the time value of money? Yes. Yeah, it's got NPV in it, right? Does it account for the riskiness of cash flows? Yes, because it's got NPV in it. Does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? 
Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. Nobody thinks no. Well, in truth, this is another one of those half star measures. If this thing is greater than one, we know we're creating wealth, but we don't know how much. And so I'm gonna give this thing two and a half stars. I'm gonna give this two and a half stars because it does tell us whether we're creating or destroying wealth, but it doesn't tell us how much. Questions? Okay. So, I told you I'd tell you why we would actually use this. It's actually helpful during capital rationing. Remember that finance theory assumes if you've got a positive NPV project, you can always get financing for that. And, and for the most part, we're gonna see that is true. But sometimes you do have capital rationing, like when I told you about my, uh, my first major employer, that they weren't able to raise money in the debt or capital markets. And so basically they were stuck using the internally generated return, which was the uh, addition to retained earnings. Okay, so how are we gonna go about this? Well, we are going to rank our projects. So we're gonna have all our projects and we're gonna calculate a PI for each of them. And then we're going to rank them in descending order of PI. What's descending order? Yeah, going down, getting smaller. And so the trick is that we are going to start going down that list and accepting projects until we run out of money. So let's do an example here. We've got our different projects. A, B, C, D. Um, we have the initial investment. And we have a PI for each of them. So let's say this one's 3.2, this one's 2.7, this one is uh, 1.9, this one is 1.1. Now, do I even need to put PI less than one on my list? No, because we never accept a negative NPV project, therefore we're never gonna accept anything with PI less than one. By the way, if we had enough money to go that far down the list, we don't need to be using PI because we're not under capital rationing. Okay, so let's look at, we have one million dollars we can invest. The first project, A, costs $300,000. $300,000. Do I accept it or reject it? Yeah, we accept it and the reason is we know it's got a PI greater than one and we happen to have that much money. After funding this $300,000 project, how much money do we have left? 700,000, okay. Our next project here is B and it costs 400,000 and has a PI of 2.7. Do we accept or reject? Yeah, we accept it because it's less than the amount of money we have left and it's got a PI of 2.7, so for sure we accept it. Now, Project C costs um, $800,000. Do we accept it or reject it? Reject it. Yeah, we reject it, why? We don't have the money, right? So this is a big no. And then the last project, let's make this work out really easy here. It's um, 300,000. Should we accept it or reject it? Yeah, we go ahead and accept it because we have 300,000. Now, note that these initial investments, they've all got my 10% contingency in them, right? And so, if these things run over, then I'm not gonna be in a world of hurt, right? If I don't put the contingency in and I totally budget out that million dollars that I've got, there's a chance that I'm gonna run over. And by the way, money's not just growing on trees for this company, right? They're undergoing capital rationing. So we'd have to be careful about that. Okay, now we say this gives the biggest bang for the buck. So it's given the amount of money that I've got to invest. What can I do that would most, or that would maximize shareholder wealth? And that's not a question we have to ask when we have unlimited capital because we can 
fund all of the positive net present value projects and so we don't have to worry about it. So who's good at, uh, who needs this sort of thing? Well, uh, one thing is are startup firms. Uh, when you first start up, do you think people are willing to just hand you oodles and gobs of cash? No, when you're first starting out, by the way, what are the typical sources of funding for a startup? The entrepreneur's wealth. By the way, the most creative, active people in this area are, who's that? Oh. It's the people that are coming to spray my yard for mosquitoes. Um, let's see. Startup firms. When people start out, they typically start with their own wealth. And most of these creative, uh, really energetic people are about your age. Raise your hand if you have enough money to fund a startup company. You don't. And so typically, what comes next? Investors. Investors. But are they just any investor off the street? Friends, no, no Friends and relatives. You call up your parents, you say, I've got this great idea. And they say, we pay for your education, and they hang out. Right? <laughs> so then you call your favorite uncle who made way too much money down at the casino, and you know he's just going to piddle it away on internet porn. And so what do you do? You're like, hey, Uncle Bob. Why? Not that I have an Uncle Bob that did that. Back to the story. Um, hey, Uncle Bob, um, you know, I've got this great idea. Da, 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 da. And so in the end, you end up getting a bunch of investors from your family and whatnot. Okay, now let's assume that you are able to get this idea into a stage where it's worth something. Then you take it to people that are called venture capitalists. And the venture capitalists will start spotting you some money. But here's what I'm going to tell you about every single group that I've mentioned so far. None of them are going to hand you an unlimited amount of money. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Rafael, because she's been around almost as long as I have. I want you to look around at this room full of 20-somethings <laughs> and tell me how many of them you would pledge unlimited capital to. Zero. Exactly. <laughs> Zero. And so this is why we see that startups have this problem that they have capital rationing. And so what does that mean? It means when you're doing your, you're looking at your projects, you've got to figure out what's the most important thing to you. And by the way, typically a venture capitalist, in addition to providing funding, one of the things they're going to help you do is recognize what you need to do next. And one of the ways they're going to make sure that you do that thing is that they're not going to give you money to do anything else, right? And so we're going to end up with this rationing of capital. Now, I had a student who sat right here. He was an engineer, and he, I think he still works here in town, but he said that he'd actually ran into this at FEMA. What does FEMA stand for? It's not just the first four letters of FEMA. Federal Emergency Management Association Administration. Nobody knows for sure, or it could be agency. Who knows? Okay, well, you know who I'm talking about, though. These are the people that come in after a tornado, and they'll... Uh, so I, I lived in Mississippi right after Hurricane Katrina, and we had all these little trailers that people were living in, and they had been provided by FEMA. Why? Because their homes were gone, right? And so they're, they're living in these little trailers and these little trailer parks. That's the kind of stuff that FEMA does. And so they're really all about cleaning up after disasters. But what if you could prevent disasters? Can you prevent a hurricane? No. Can you prevent a tornado? No. Can you prevent flooding without building a bunch of dams and stuff? No, but you can mitigate the damage from flooding. So you go down by the river, and there aren't any houses or anything, and then there's flooding, the water rises up, but then what eventually happens? Water goes down, and basically no harm, no foul, right? But for some reason, people like to live near the water. Have you noticed this? In fact, you'll find people living in a van down by the river. Now, the good news is if the flooding is coming, usually those people can like fire up the van and take off. But what if your house is down by the river? It starts to flood, the best thing you can do is pull up your pants and get out of there, right? Okay, so what happens is 
because the United States government is silly enough to come up with something called flood insurance, which doesn't pay for itself, by the way. Um, they end up having to subsidize these people to rebuild their houses. And so let's say Ms. Flowers has her house down by the river and her house gets flooded out and she's got flood insurance and she collects on that. What do you think she's gonna do? What's human nature? Buy, buy a new house? Yeah. Oh, no, man. What are you gonna do? You're gonna rebuild in the same spot. Three years from now, we got another damn flood. Miss Flowers calls up FEMA again. Hip, sorry. They go, oh, you poor thing, here's some more money. Right? And this happens over and over and over again. There's a house in Fort Smith, Arkansas, but it's like famous. And the only people who will live there, it's a, it's a rent house, the only people who will live there are people who move in from out of town between floods because everyone else knows this is a flood house, right? Okay, so on with the story. What does FEMA do? Every year, Congress sets aside a certain amount of money for FEMA to go around and buy up these properties that are gonna, we know are gonna eventually get flooded out. And how do they get that information? Well, local, they put out a request for proposals, RFP is what they would say, request for proposals. And they say, tell us about a property, tell us what it would cost to procure the property, what it would cost to tear it down, and we'll talk about that in a minute, what it would cost to tear it down, and then calculate the PI. So let's talk about the PI. Where, so when we're, we're built buying a new machine, we expect revenues to increase, and that's your positive cash flows in the future. What are the positive cash flows from buying a house and tearing it down? Do you remember earlier when I kept giving her money and patting her on the head? If we buy the house and tear it down, do we have to do that? No, so it's not positive cash flows, it's avoidance of a negative cash flow, which by the way, same thing, right? Okay, so uh, those are where our savings are gonna come from. So of course you gotta estimate how often it's gonna flood, how much it's gonna cost each time, that sort of thing. Okay, now let's talk about why we have to tear down the house. Would it be enough for me to just buy the house from Ms. Flowers and say, thanks for, your, thanks for working with us and and see her off. Would that be enough? What happens with vacant houses? What do they attract? Homeless people? Animals? Lonely teenagers looking for love? Right? Um, what about drug labs? I mean, I can't think of a single positive thing that these houses would attract, right? Does that make sense? And by the way, let's, let's assume that a homeless person living in the house was a good thing because they were homeless and now they're not. What happens when it floods? They're homeless again, or, and they might be riding down the river on a, right, on a piece of the house. So, you know, it's one of those, it's a bad thing. Okay, so uh, that's why we have to tear the house down. Okay, now, uh, the one that my student was working on was a restaurant that was down in uh, Ozark, and it was on the Finley River, and the thing was even called, like, something river or something like, well, anyway, it, it just, the little river, in, I think, it just kept flooding out, and so that was the project he proposed. He did his profitability index, and they send it in, and then... Uh, what happens is, and I'm pretty sure it's an intern that does this, they get all the applications and they put them in descending orders of PI. And then the actual administrator goes through and accepts projects just like we did here until they run out of money for the next year. At which point they send a letter to the remaining people who had a PI greater than one that says, sorry, try again next year. Right, because there might be more money next year, there might be less, but you know, next year maybe the other projects won't be as good. And so they tell them to hold on to that and try again next year. Does that make sense? Okay, so, and by the way, that is capital rationing because Congress only puts out a set amount of money every year to do that. 
Now let's talk about something that PI has in common with IRR, and that is that it can lead to bad decisions for mutually exclusive projects. So let's go back to, to uh, we've, we've already calculated these numbers. NPV. NPV for Project A, I believe, was something like 24.34. Does that sound right? So we'll go ahead and write that down. And let's go ahead and figure out the PI. Remember, PI is 1 plus NPV divided by the initial investment. NPV here is 24.34 divided by, do I include the negative sign? No. Divide by 100, so that's 0.2434, we add 1. So that makes, to, to me, I think that the PI is 1.2434. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you look at the other one, if I remember correctly, the NPV was something like 119.08. Is that right? 119.08 divided by 1,000, don't include the negative, gives us 0 0.11908, add 1, and we end up with something like 1.119. Does that sound right? Okay, now between 1.2434 and 1.119, which of those sounds better to you? If you're just going by PI, which of those sound better to you? Yeah, Project A. This is because PI has exactly the same problem as IRR in that it does not take into account the scale of the investment. It does not take into account the scale of the investment. So if you've got mutually exclusive projects, you're certainly not going to want to use PI. The good news is, though, it does not share the other problem that IRR has, which was the multiple IRRs. Because we're using NPV here, and we know NPV is immune to that problem, we don't have to worry about it here with PI. So this is the only problem that it shares with IRR. Questions? Yes. What's the uh, PI on the second one? Was it 2.19? No, I think it was 1.119. I think you were off by one decimal place there. Because I think what you did is you didn't divide by 1,000, you divided by 100. I did. Very good. Good question. Other questions? Okay, let's talk about what happens in the real world. So, some finance professors were bored, and so they put together a survey to ask people, what do you guys actually do? And they sent it out to a bunch of finance and accounting types at all sorts of different sizes of organizations. By the way, this is all in the United States. And they asked, how often do you use something on a scale of zero, never, to four always. And then they divided the results into large firms and small firms, and they reported what was the average rating. So in other words, the higher this number, the more often the people use the measure. And so up here at the top, we have IRR as, uh, as, our, as our first. But I want you to notice, we'll look both at IRR and NPV at the same time. <coughs> That number between 3.41 and 3.42 between large firms, is that really distinguishable? Do you think there's a significant difference between those? It's basically the same. And we look over at small firms with 2.87 and 2.83, basically the same. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that if we had enough to do MPV, we had exactly what we need to do IRR. I'm going to show you how easy it is to do IRR if you've already done an MPV project, and vice versa, right? And so it's really not a big deal to get both of those, and I would always encourage you to do both if you're going to use MPV or IRR. Now, notice that small firms are less likely to use this than large firms, and I think there are at least a couple of reasons for this. Any ideas? How do you think the size of the projects compare between small firms and large firms? Smaller firms have smaller projects? Yeah, smaller firms have smaller projects. And at some point, you get so small that it's not worth doing an NPV analysis. Does that make sense? OK. So that's reason number one is small firms probably have smaller projects. 
And number two, small firms are less likely to have a finance person. Let me walk through you with this. So this, we talked about the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur starts a business and they finally make enough money, they need to start thinking in a dollars and cents kind of way. What's the first professional that they hire? Yeah, they hire an accountant because they want to be able to do their taxes correctly because they don't want to go to jail. And so they hire an accountant. And so the top financial thinker at the firm is more likely to be an accountant at a smaller firm. But as the firm grows and you start thinking in, in larger terms, that's when you start bringing on finance people and that's when you start hearing about NPV and IRR. So that's another possible reason that we would see small firms being less likely to use these more sophisticated measures. And then we have the payback method. And if you look at this, payback is uh, it's the number three at both, but it's more popular at small firms than large firms. And the reason is exactly what we just said. The projects at small firms are likely to be smaller and they're less likely to have a sophisticated financial thinker coming up with the decision criteria for the company. And so that's why we see payback being more popular at small firms. And then we see discounted payback, that dog with fleas. Just, just don't even look at that. Avert your eyes. Now, accounting rate of return. Uh, large firms, 1.25. Uh, small firms, 1.41. A couple of observations here. Number one, I am so pleased that so, people, so few people actually use that. Number two is it's more likely to be used at a small firm than a large firm, and it all boils down to what we just mentioned. That is, the first financial thinker a company is likely to hire is an accountant. Does that make sense? Okay. By the way, to a man with only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. How does that fit with the accountant and the accounting average, the average accounting return? That's the world they live in, right? To a man with only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay, now, finally, we are down to profitability index, or PI. And you say, wow, that must be a total crap measure because it's used even less than discounted payback in the accounting rate of return. And the answer here is no, that's not correct. The reason we see profitability index being used so seldom in the United States is not because it's a crap rule. It's because capital rationing is so rare. Remember, we said that the PI is popular or useful when there is capital rationing. In the United States, we have well-functioning capital markets. We have a well-functioning banking industry. We have all sorts of ways that firms can raise money. So capital rationing is fairly low, and therefore, a profitability index hardly gets used. Now, I had to keep hitting on the United States here because I had a student sitting on the front row and she just kept shaking her head. And I said, what's wrong? She says, that's totally wrong. And she says, capital rationing happens all the time. I said, where are you from? And she said, Vietnam. Now let's explain why in Vietnam, and it would be true in China too, Mr. Wong. Uh, who, owned, let's ask Mr. Wong. He is our China expert. Mr. Wong, who owns the banks in China? The government. Very good. Same, same is true in Vietnam. Now, in these kinds of societies, you also will tend to have what are called state-owned enterprises. So a lot of the oil companies, steel companies, electric producers will be owned by the government. And then you'll also have private enterprise. Assume you've got two people that go to the bank, and one of them works for the private enterprise, and one of them works for the state-owned enterprise, and they're going to the government bank loan officer. Let's say uh, Ms. Gass is our government bank loan officer. Who are you going to give the money to? The one that I own. Yeah, the one, the state-owned enterprise. By the way, state-owned enterprises, they don't just maximize shareholder wealth. Their goals, they have political goals too, right? And how did she get her job at the government bank? Was it by being a contrarian, hardcore free market? <laughs> no. It's because she's friends with the people in power, right? 
By the way, Mr. Wong, is it a good job to have to work at a bank in China? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And I so when I go to China and I walk into a bank, there's always and it doesn't matter how small the branch is or where it's at, there's always one English speaker. And they help me with my stuff. And then I say, did you go to school in the US? And they'll say, yes. And I say, what did you study? And they'll say, accounting, or I have an MBA. Now, would you expect to be a bank teller if you had that kind of education from here? No, but if you're in one of these countries where that's a politically favored kind of thing, um, and by the way, it's stability, right? Stability is why you want that job. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so do you, do you start to see the point? If she gives the money, if she tells the state-owned enterprise, no way, and gives the money instead to Ms. Raphael, who has her own private enterprise, uh, not only is she going to be probably in trouble with her boss, but there's going to be some other troubles too. And so that's why we see capital is rationed for private enterprises in these sorts of situations. And so if you find yourself for some reason in a country that's set up like this, maybe you'll be using profitability ratio a whole lot more than we do here in the United States. Questions? Yes, so why do so many firms use discounted payback? Like, are they just ignorant? <laughs> or, like, what's the point? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so, it, is it easy to change a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And so to go from payback to discounted payback, you basically have to learn, what, one new trick? Mm -hmm. And so people are like, oh, okay, well, this is just like we used to do with payback, but now we're going to do discounted payback. It's even better. And then there, of course, will be a couple of people that growl. I don't see the difference. I don't care. Now, what they don't realize is that by making that one additional step is that they now have enough to do something real, right? Does that make sense? So it's, it's like here at the university. Do you think we ever make big changes? Mm -hmm. Everything's incremental. Everything is incremental. Does that make sense? Okay, that's just my guess, because I have never worked with an organization that was silly enough to use this kind of payback. Good question. Other questions? Okay.